Um, yeah. Uh, what do you think? It's a pretty amazing story, and it's, it had never been told before. Um, we tried not to focus too much on the documents that support it, but just try to tell the story and to tell it in a way that would get the point across that the great novel of the sea that has no women in it is actually haunted, I think, from page one by this woman. And just as I say, his first novel, Taipei, had a, a woman at the center of it, Feiwei, this Polynesian maiden. I think this novel on every page, Moby Dick, uh, breathes out that, that obsession that drove him to sacrifice everything um, for love. And uh, it ruined his life, destroyed his life, and I think he knew that, and I think when he told the, the tale of Ahab ruining his life and those around him, their lives as well, and going down with the ship to pursue this white whale that he had no reason to pursue, um, is a hint of what he could see facing him. And I just think it, it, it transforms that novel so that when people read Melville and Love, sometimes they go back and look at Moby Dick and they read an entirely different book. It, it, it really looks different from the other side now. And you can probably tell why the old Melville scholars hate this, because it, for one thing, they resent the fact that they didn't see it. And so they've constantly played down the, the part this woman played in his life, because I think they don't want to see a woman in his life. They want to see Hawthorne or anybody else, but not Sarah Morwood. And um, I think that's a great shame. And when we compare her to Emily Dickinson, we're not comparing her poetry, which is nowhere near what Emily's is. We're just comparing the fact that 35 miles away in Amherst, Massachusetts, Emily Dickinson was living in obscurity and would have been forgotten easily uh, if it hadn't been for her family years later after her death recovering her poetry. So I felt with recovering Sarah's story, that was something of that same kind of effort to reclaim um, a woman's lost voice and a woman's influence on one of the great novels in American literature. Yeah. Oh, we got a question right by Professor Williams, then I'll go back. But, yeah. what, was, what would you say was the cause for the failure of Moby Dick? And then what caused its Popularity, what, what was going on here? Two things, the, in the 1850s, the notion that anyone would be so obsessed and would destroy everything for this obsession, especially when he did it in a profane way. In other words, Ahab is constantly cursing the universe and, and God and daring retribution against him. Um, famously, the, the characters around Ahab plead with him to give up the hunt for the white whale, and he won't do it. And he makes them all kind of pledge in a, a very demonic moment their, their faith to him, to Ahab, rather than to God, to continue pursuing this whale. So that, that, sacrilegious, that sacrilegious element in it turned a lot of Americans off in the 1850s. What brought it back was World War I. Seventy years later, the carnage of World War I made people suddenly understand what happens when madmen lead other men off the brink into slaughter, into uh, the abyss. The abyss made a lot more sense after World War I, and almost on cue in 1920, 1921, you suddenly get a resurgence of interest in Melville, and it, it never stops. But it begins in 1920, 1919, actually, and keeps going. Ricardo. Uh, I'll, I'll repeat it for him. He asked why those papers weren't looked at before. The letters, some of them were known about. The papers about Sarah weren't. Uh, no one had looked in that box. And I came down one day, because I was curious, I could, I could sense a story. And I came down and I said, can I look in that box? 
And they told me they had a box full of more wood papers. And so I looked in it, and suddenly the whole, the woman came to life for me. I suddenly realized this is a real woman, intellectual, um, uh, sensitive, artistic, the kind of woman Herman Melville would have been attracted to. And she, it's only when she comes to life, when you can put a real personality to her, that the obsession makes sense. That you suddenly understand why Melville would have thought a woman who loved books as much as he does, who loved poetry as much as he does, who loved um, the Berkshires as much as he does. And they both saw the Berkshires as a kind of paradise. Not in February, <laughs> not in winter it isn't, but in summer it's gorgeous. It, it, and it does remind you of the sea. There are vistas across this green paradise that just are stunning. Um, and very um, moderate weather. And the fall, of course, autumn, is amazing with the colors. So they fell in love with the landscape and they fell in love with each other. And there they lived together for 13 years. But because of what he had done originally to try and build all this into something, writing Moby Dick and then writing Pierre, and they had not worked, he set himself on a path to obscurity and poverty that he never got out of. He spent the last 20 years of his life working as a clerk on the docks in New York City for the customs department. And one day, a writer came down and saw him there who had known him when he was a famous writer in the late 1840s and said, are you Herman Melville? And Melville said, yes. And he, and he said, what are you doing here? And I think that's the big question. It, it, it's one that we have to ask when, when a great writer goes neglected and is misunderstood. You have to say, what, what's wrong with the world around us? And I've sensed some of this with this, with this story is that you'd think a story like this would make Melville larger and bigger and more interesting as a human being. But there are a lot of people who just want him to be the lonely old guy on the ship. That's what they want. How did these, all these uh, people, all these academics that are studying Melville for a long time, what did they tell you when they saw your... Uh, oh, they, they hate it. When they read the book. Can you give an example? Well, I asked them to say, I, I, I would ask them questions and say, okay, tell me something that's wrong. No, it's not wrong. I said, well, what's your problem? We just don't think he would take her seriously. I said, why not? Well, you know, he's got Hawthorne. <laughs> I said, he was only there for a year. I said, if, if you move someplace and, <laughs> and the guy you supposedly moved there to be near leaves, but the other person stays for 12 years and you stay for 12 years, it might be that other person. You know, it might be that's the person that drew you there. It's, it's like a lot of things nowadays. You get an established narrative and everybody's wed to it and fixed to it and they just won't give it up. They're like dogs with bones. They just, they've got their teeth in it, and you, you can't pull it out. It's gradually changing, and this film is changing it, because the more people see this film, we wanted to show them the, these, this is not made up. The, the documents are there. The place tells the story. Um, the facts of their relationship are, are proven. So you just have to deny that such an attraction existed, but you would be denying all these facts. And yet, as we now see in our world, a lot of people are very happy to deny facts because it doesn't fit their narrative. And that's just what happens. I think it's a shame that we do that, but that's the way things are going. Um, I must give credit to the filmmaker, Seth Newton, because his images in here are so beautiful that he's been able to bring out from the Berkshires, and he lives near there. So he was able to film a lot of this in all seasons, and I like that as well. You see the area, in, especially in, in the winter, um, and he does a lot with the snow on Sarah's grave, and then you see her grave in high summer. And it, I was the first to discover her grave. It took a long time, and my wife and I finally tracked it down, and we were first taken aback because something happened to take the top half of that stone off. We don't know what. And then it sunk down into the ground, and one of our plans is to try to restore it, to restore her grave. 
And it's interesting to give you an idea about women in that time is that it doesn't say on her grave, you may not have been able to read it, but it doesn't say Sarah Morewood. It says Sarah Ann, wife of John Morewood. He's, he's her property. And so you have to understand the position of women at the time to understand how incredibly risky it was for Melville to, to have this affair and for her to have the affair with him. If it blew up and became public, their lives would have been destroyed. And they, that's why it may seem exaggerated to compare it to Ahab and his whale, but in the society at that time, it would be catastrophic to have something like this revealed. And I think it's partly the reason that Hawthorne took off. I think Hawthorne, the author of The Scarlet Letter, had a good sense of what was going on between Melville and Sarah and didn't want his own reputation to be diminished if that scandal exploded while he was there. So he took off and he did it very abruptly. It, it's as though he suddenly figured out, oh, that's what's going on and took off. Anything else? You mentioned in the film that the child would have been his, and then you suggest there were more than one child? She, she had three children. We think the last two were Melville's. She's very rarely with Mr. Morwood after she meets Melville. He stays in New York. He's got a business there. He's very wealthy. And he, he buys the property for her so she can have it for herself. It's her playground. And he rarely comes. So if somebody's getting her pregnant, it's probably the guy next door. <laughs> uh, both, it's interesting, he gave Mr. Morwood, she just asked about the family, what, what happened to all of them, to these three children. The oldest one was favored by the father and given the best education money could buy. He was sent to England to go to rugby school. Um, everything was given to him. The other two children were neglected. Guess, we can guess why. In fact, when the daughter married, there was, a da there was this older son, Mr. Morwood's son, then a daughter, probably Melville's daughter, and then a, a younger son. When the daughter married, Melville wrote the toast to be read at her wedding. You know, that might be a clue. <laughs> if you get married and, and the neighbor writes your wedding toast, that might be some indication that was, something's going on. Um, so those two, the daughter and the son, the younger son, lived out relatively short lives and never had children and died pretty much in obscurity. In fact, I didn't even know about the third child until I found his grave. Um, and it's interesting. I don't know if you noticed this, but all the children who Mr. Morwood would have buried, he outlived them, they all have crosses. They all have the traditional Christian cross. Sarah does not. And Sarah, as you, you may have caught in this, compared herself to Lot's wife, the woman who disobeyed God and her husband by turning back and looking at Sodom and turned to a pillar of salt as a result. And, I think Mr. Morwood knew all about the affair and did not do as, as Melville's wife suggested, to know all is to forgive all. I don't think he quite forgave. And I think her grave uh, does not have that cross on it for a reason. I think she saw herself as an outcast and so did her husband. Michael, I wonder if uh, knowing where the graves are and so on, if uh, ever a uh, DNA test was uh, uh, thought about, and uh, if, if you do think that uh, even with the uh, scientific evidence, your critics would be convinced. It's funny you say that because during the making of the film, we kept saying, can we do a core sample? You know, could we sort of dig down here? And uh, it would take the, perm in America, you have to get the permission of relatives to dig up any grave. And the relatives are all gone. So I don't know what it would take, but um, I don't know that it would prove much because we don't have a good DNA sample from Melville's side of the family now. Um, there is a, a great, there was a great, great granddaughter alive at one point, but I don't know what's happened to her. 
But I'm, I'm assuming if we got permissions all the way around and we tracked enough people down, we might be able to do it. Um, I just don't know. I would like to ask also to ask you about the, the role that uh, Luis Camões' poetry had in Herman Melville's uh, life and work. It's an excellent question because I, I cite on a couple of pages the fact that after Sarah's death, Melville was so distraught that he came upon uh, an edition of Camões' po poetry and took great consolation as though Camões was a, a fellow sufferer who had died in obscurity and died of heartbreak. And he related to him so much that he wrote two poems about him uh, shortly after Sarah's death. What happens after her death is he falls apart, and so does his family. You, you may not have entirely understood that the oldest son of Melville's, the one born before his affair, put a gun to his head and blew his brains out at the age of 18. And the wife, Lizzie, was so frightened of Herman, who was thrashing about the house and throwing things, that her family even plotted to, to uh, abduct her from the house and take her away from this crazed man. And in the middle of all this insanity that he had been driven to, very Ahab-like, he discovered the works of this great Portuguese poet. And, and wrote very movingly about what happens when, you, when your dreams are shattered and no one recognizes your genius. And I discovered that he also had written about Camos in um, the first novel, I mean, the, 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 the last novel he wrote before Moby Dick, which is called White Jacket. And in there, you actually hear Macau mentioned. He, uh, the White Jacket has a character say, to a bunch of sailors, boys, you must go to Macau. You must see the great grotto and its winding paths of flowers. He describes it very vividly. Um, so he, he saw him almost as a magnet who had suffered many of the same things. And it's a, it's a powerful moment. And it helped him get through this dark period of his life and eventually to reconcile with his wife, though I think her, her own insanity is is visible, first time it's ever been seen, of that scrawled to know all is to forgive all in her desk. She, we think she took her letter opener and carved that in there one day. And presumably it was something of a comfort to her. I don't think she ever forgave. <laughs> and they lived uneasily for the rest of their lives together. Very uneasily. Anything else? Any doubters? No? It looks pretty obvious to me. But if I showed this to a bunch of Melville scholars, they'd all be throwing things at me right now. Shoes, purses, anything. I'm curious about uh, how you choose your uh, biography uh, subjects. Is it because of your literary interests or More than that, you, you need to have some, some new story, some new evidence That's to start it. an investigation. Yeah, you want, a, you want a new story. You want something that gives you a different take on a great life. There's no reason to just rehearse old stories. And I, if I don't get that, I walk away from it. I just walk away. But fortunately, most of these stories, I, I seem to have a bit of a nose for it, so I follow the trail. And uh, in the case of Melville, I think I really hit some pay dirt because this story for me helps to explain a lot that I didn't understand about Melville. Um, it's, it's pretty amazing to think that 40 years go by after Moby Dick in which Melville becomes increasingly marginalized and forgotten till his death, the New York Times publishes one short paragraph and misspells his name. So, you know, he, he, he was written off. And if you think about it, it took 70 years. If we go to 1920, it took 70 years for his reputation to be reestablished. That's a long time. And in that time, you see, what happened was the facts of his life and the trail went really cold. And because it was so cold, by the time I came along, it had long been dismissed as, you know, you're just not going to find out about Melville's life. Certain things are just gone forever, and they almost were. 
So it was, it was one of these projects of reclaiming a story that was really, I think, this far from disappearing. And those letters that I was looking at with the librarian, those are normally kept in a vault and rarely, this was the only time they'd ever been taken out of the vault and photographed. So that's how, you know, uncommon this, this, this sort of thing is. And the letters, by the way, are so beautifully written. Melville had a lousy hand. He, he, normally he wrote very poorly. And his manuscripts, what exists of them, are just a mess, just a real mess. But to her, he wrote in his best hand. And, and there are no other letters even remotely like those that he wrote to Sarah Morwood. They're, they're wonderful. And they were wonderful to hold in my hands. Um, letters from 166 years ago. Quite extraordinary. So it was a very moving experience for me um, to see all these things. Anything else? Well, spread the story. Tell people Melville wrote Moby Dick under the influence of an of amazing woman. Uh, because that's what happened. Thank you. Thank you all.